Hello again, everyone. This is Mr. Hill, Texas history teacher for Team Michigan State at Owsley Junior High School. And today we are going to be learning about the Mexican-American War. Now, before we get started, if you are a virtual learner, learning at home, uh, make sure that you make a copy of the Google Doc version of the Mexican-American War C-Notes. Uh, find the link in Canvas, uh, click it, make a copy of the notes, and then you will fill in those notes. If you're in class, uh, there's a good chance, at least in my class, that you're going to be filling these in on a set of paper notes. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> the, just to let you know, the, the Mexican War was a direct result of the American belief that the United States had the right to expand from the Atlantic Ocean westward to the Pacific Ocean. And if you remember, we call that, what? That's right, Manifest Destiny. So let's take a look at our essential question for today. The essential question is, what were the causes of the Mexican-American War and how did it affect Texas? So remember, <clears throat> if you're doing these notes at home, you can pause this video uh, and type in the notes as you need. Uh, same with if you're watching the video and, and writing it down. So what were the causes of the Mexican-American War and how did it affect Texas? So first, we need to understand what caused the war. And like I said, the war was a direct result of Manifest Destiny, but there was more. First off, the annexation of Texas. In 1844, James K. Polk was elected president of the United States. Uh, now, aside from the fact that Polk had one of the most awesome mullets in U.S. presidential history, Polk also wanted to expand the borders of the United States. Polk had promised, it was a campaign promise, and when he ran for president, he made this promise just like all people who run for president do. He promised that he was going to fulfill manifest destiny. Spoiler alert, he did. So, in 1845, the United States annexed Texas. We learned about that back before we went to holiday break. So, Texas enters as the 28th state in the Union, and Texas entered the U.S. as a slave state. Now, right now, that's not that important. Later on, it's going to be very important. There was a border dispute. Now, a border dispute is basically when two countries, uh, or it could be two cities, two states, it could be you and your neighbor next door have a disagreement about where their property ends and where yours begins. So in the case of what we're talking about here, we're talking about a border dispute between Mexico and Texas that became a border dispute between Mexico and the United States when Texas became a state. So there was trouble brewing with Mexico. The Treaty of Velasco which Santa Ana signed to end the Texas Revolution. Remember, he was captured and he was um, imprisoned and, and he was forced to sign the Treaty of Velasco, ending the revolution. Uh, in that treaty, it stated that the border between Texas and Mexico was the Rio Grande. But 
the problem is Mexico never acknowledged that treaty. They said that Santa Ana had been forced to sign the treaty and that they never recognized Texas as an independent nation and they certainly did not recognize the Rio Grande as the border between Mexico and Texas. Instead, Mexico believed the border was the Nueces River, which was, for, which was farther north. Mexico also believed that Texas was much smaller than the Texans believed. So let's take a look. <clears throat> Here we have a map of what Texas looked like in 1836 when Texas won its independence. Now, Texas and the United States believed that the Rio Grande River, this river that flows from the basically from the Rocky Mountains through New Mexico and down separating Texas and, and Mexico now. But Mexico believed, or Texas believed, and the United States believed that the Rio Grande was the border between Mexico and the U.S. because of the Treaty of Velasco. Mexico never accepted the Treaty of Velasco and believed that the Nueces River was the border between Texas and Mexico because at one time when Texas was part of Mexico, Texas had been part of a much larger state called Te uh, Coahuila y Tejas. So the Nueces River had been the border between the Tejas part and the Coahuila part. So naturally, Mexico assumes that the border between Texas and Mexico is at the Nueces River. So this little green part here is what Mexico believed Texas was made up of. So as a result of this disagreement, the area between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande became known as the Nueces Strip and was a disputed territory. The U.S. believed the orange area was part of the U.S. Mexico believed the orange area was part of Mexico. So you can see there's that dispute over the border. So, causes of the war, continuing. President Polk um, sent the United States Army to Texas, knowing that if the U.S. Army encountered the Mexican Army in that disputed area, it would likely cause Mexico to react violently, and this could start a war. So. What this is saying, and there's a lot of truth to it, Polk sent the army down to provoke Mexico into a fight so that the United States and Mexico would indeed go to war. On April 25th, 1876, I'm sorry, 1846, April 25th, 1846, 70 United States cavalry soldiers, or soldiers trained to fight on horseback, were attacked by 2,000 Mexican soldiers in this disputed territory. 11 Americans were killed. Now, because of that, Polk was then able to go before the United States Congress and basically say American blood had been spilled on American soil. And this whipped Congress into such a frenzy that the United States Congress declared war on Mexico. So the Mexican War um, lasted less than two years, from April 1846 to February 1848. Now, in the past, um, when um, um, when we taught the Mexican War, the U.S.-Mexican War, or the Mexican-American War, 
when we taught that, we spent time actually learning about the, the battles of the Mexican War. And uh, unfortunately, they kind of took that out of our curriculum. We don't take as much time. But you need to know the, the, the U.S.-Mexican War, the Mexican-American War, um, had some amazing stories in it. And it would be one of those things that if you ever fell down a rabbit hole one night and just looked and read some of the stories about um, the uh, the war, the battles, the individuals that, that fought in the war, um, you know, the, the Texas Rangers um, became famous worldwide uh, as a result of the Mexican-American War. Uh, the Texas Rangers volunteered and uh, joined the U.S. Army, and they served as scouts for General Zachary Taylor, the commander of the U.S. Army. And some of the exploits that the, the Rangers um, had during the Mexican-American War are just are, are make for amazing reading. So, you know, one of these days, if you're not busy and you absolutely have nothing else to do, you should look up the Mexican-American War and the Texas Rangers part of it. So, like I said, the war lasted less than two years. The United States won a decisive victory in the war, despite the fact that they were outnumbered in their, nearly every battle. Uh, in all, a little over 13,000 American lives were lost compared to over 25,000 Mexican lives. Um, some of the battles uh, of the uh, Mexican War, uh, the Battle of Resaca de la Palma, the Battle of Palo Alto, and of course the Battle of Mexico City that saw the United States Army occupy uh, and take over Mexico City uh, before control was handed back to the Mexican government. Um, we're going to watch a short video, I'll make it available online, also about one of the battles in Mexico City during the war and how a group of um, young teenage boys from Mexico um, gave their lives uh, in defense of their home. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty stirring. So, all in all, the Mexic uh, the Americans had a major advantage in the war because their weapons were far superior to those used by the Mexican army. Uh, weapons like the 1841 field howitzer. Uh, that could fire a 12 pound uh, shot over a thousand yards, that's over a half a mile. Um, the Mexican army really didn't have anything that could compare to that. Um, the uh, Colt Walker re uh, revolver that was uh, designed by Texas Ranger Samuel Colt uh, that fired a 44 caliber bullet uh, and was powerful enough to, to kill a horse uh, at a distance. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Americans, they, they had the best that, that, that the government and uh, private industry in the United States could offer. In most cases, the Mexican army was using weapons that were more than 25 years old. We're talking they were using weapons that had been left over from when Spain had controlled Mexico. Uh, flintlock muskets and single shot pistols and outdated artillery uh, cannons and such. The U.S. also had an advantage of superior leadership. Uh, many of the young officers who served in the U.S.-Mexican War would go on to great fame during the U.S. Civil War. We're talking about men that we still hear of today who are whose names are spoken and spoken in reverence uh, for their uh, their leadership qualities and their ability to um, uh, to lead men uh, men like Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson, just to name a very very few. A lot of names you would recognize. Well, if you knew a lot about the Civil War, <laughs> so. The end of the Mexican-American War. Uh, the 
Agreement that ended the war was called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It was signed by the United States and Mexico on February 2nd, 1848. It ended the war, but it did more than that. It gave the United States vast amounts of land that now makes up the southwest part of the country. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo also said, as besides ending the war, that Mexico recognized Texas as a United States state and in return the United States paid $15 million to Mexico for the land that they acquired. Also, the Rio Grande River was set as the southern border of Texas. Now, that land that the United States acquired was called the Mexican Cession. And in 1848, the United States grew. Uh, and achieved even more manifest destiny. The Mexican session included all our part of California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and somehow I missed Arizona, Arizona. So Mexico ceded or gave up its northern part, including California, for $15 million. The United States now controlled all the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Now, a little added information here. The United States paid $15 million for all of this land, okay? Uh, they could have taken the land. Well, they did take the land. Let's just be honest. The United States took the land known as the Mexican Cession, and they paid Mexico $15 million, I guess, to sort of make themselves feel better because they had basically stolen this land from Mexico. Then, one year later, in 1849, gold was discovered in California. Much much more money, that gold was worth much more money than that mere $15 million that the United States gave up. So that sort of adds insult to injury for Mexico, aside from losing the war, losing their land, then they also lose out on the fact that there were billions of dollars worth of gold in California. So two years later, something called the Compromise of 1850. Um, the United States was going through a lot of changes and a lot of those changes had to do with slavery. And we're going to be learning about slavery um, here in the coming days and, and weeks uh, as we move towards the U.S. Civil War. And the concept of slavery, this peculiar institution, was a major thing in U.S. politics. Um, so this Compromise of 1850 is done, and it, it has to do with uh, allowing states to enter the Union. It has to do with allowing um, states to enter as slave states or free states. Um, but part of the Compromise of 1850 was Texas giving up about half of its territory and getting $10 million from the United States. Now, this giving up of land set the current borders of Texas into the state that we know today, the shape of the state that we know today. It gave up this amount of, of this land in the blue to the United States, and it was added to the territories that made up the Mexican Cession. The Compromise of 1850 also added California as a free state. It added Utah and New Mexico territory. Now, this is much larger than the current Utah and New Mexico that we know today, 
Uh, but the land was divided pretty much in half between Utah Territory and New Mexico Territory. Now, it allowed these territories to decide if when they became states, if they were to enter as slave states. And it was going to be left up to the people who lived in those new states to decide if they wanted slavery. So Utah and the New Mexico territories uh, were created and they people who lived there were told that if you move to this territory, if you live in this territory, when it becomes a state, you will get to go to the polls and vote to decide if you want this to be a free state or a slave state. So that's what we call uh, when the people have the power to make decisions like that. It's a principle of government. What do we call it? That's right. Popular sovereignty at work. Now, the slave issue continues with this. The Compromise of 1850 also said that slaves could no longer be bought or sold in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is right there, kind of squished in between uh, Virginia and Maryland. And uh, both of those states were slave states. And as a result, Washington, D.C., uh, our nation's capital, was uh, slavery was allowed there. But with the Compromise of 1850, because the North did not want slavery, the South did want slavery, because there was a disagreement there, they decided that Washington, D.C. would be an area where you could bring slaves there and you could own slaves in Washington, D.C., but you could not buy or sell them. Also, as part of the Compromise of 1850, something called the Fugitive Slave Act was created, which allowed bounty hunters to track down runaway slaves in the North. Um, if you've ever seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, um, that's sort of what the Fugitive Slave Act was all about. Bounty hunters were allowed to travel into Northern states and recapture runaway slaves and take them back to the South and put them back into slavery. So that brings us to our summary. Mexico disputed the border with the U.S. and President Polk provoked the Mexican army into attacking and starting the war. So that is our lesson on the Mexican-American War. I uh, hope you learned something. Um, and until next time, y'all take it easy and I'll talk to you later. <laughs>